Okay, I think we'll get uh, this afternoon's proceedings going. Uh, thank you all for uh, attending this great uh, concluding session of the Noir Festival. I'm Tim Marshall, the Provost of the New School, and it's a great delight for me to be here to basically sort of wrap this up uh, and also to, to offer my also very special welcome to Frances McDormand, who we're delighted and honored who, uh, that she is attending uh, to this today's event and symposium because really she's also been an inspiration and the, work, the kind of work that she's involved with has been an inspiration to this festival. So if Jim Miller, up there, uh, first kicked around the idea of the Noir Festival uh, about a year or so ago with me, came into the Provost office and said, how about it? And really I think with uh, a ma one major kind of intention, I guess, and, and uh, hope for this festival, at least this is the way he reported it to me, um, and that was to have something really positive within the university that worked across the various elements of this institution. This university, as most people know, is a fairly eclectic and idiosyncratic one that has two major threads going back through history, and that is in the kind of liberal arts and social sciences, the more academic pursuits, and within the creative practicing arts. And they really, to this day, remain the two major threads of the institution. And throughout our history of this institution, there have been moments where there's been a really rich and vibrant uh, sort of melting pot of these various academic and creative pursuits, and other times where, as happens through history, they have become quite separated from one another and isolated. And I couldn't think of anyone better than Jim Miller with his rather sort of intrepid and collaborative approach to to new thinking and reinventing and collaborating and so on, to actually be part of a festival that is endeavoring to yet to again produce the beginnings of a really rich interplay between the various parts of the institution, but particularly the practice in creative arts and the, the more scholarly pursuits. So with that, I really do want to congratulate everybody that's been involved with this festival. Rob Polito has been Jim's partner in crime, so to speak, partner in noir throughout this process, so thank you to him as well. But also to all the authors and poets, filmmakers, actors, musicians, directors, composers, and theoreticians that have been engaged in this festival. You have really done a, an amazing job to celebrate and to uh, amplify this, what I described before, as the eclectic portfolio of activities that do make up and really are the new school. Uh, as it is much easier from a bureaucratic administrative point of view to keep things fairly isolated and separate because it's much easier to manage, but it ultimately really impoverishes the work that we do and limits the impact that we can have and the richness and, and sort of wonder that we can produce. So I also want to thank the deans and faculty members because they actually have been great at connecting this activity and the work of this festival to their classes and the research that have been going on. And uh, so thank you to everybody that's been involved. Lots of people behind the scenes have been producing this and working hard at it. So I'm really delighted the way this festival's turned out. It's gonna be the first of a series of festivals we're gonna run over time over the next few years. And uh, so I'm really looking forward to the next ones. Now I'm gonna introduce Cecilia Rubino, who is gonna introduce Francis McDormand. And Cecilia uh, is an assistant professor in, of theater at Lang College. She's a passionate director, actor, writer, and educator in theater. And her most recent uh, production was a great success. It's a new school production called From the Fire, an original theater piece that was based on the historic triangle shirt waist factory fire of 1911. Uh, the, piece sold, the piece played to sold out houses at the Judson Memorial Church last month. So let me, Cecilia, wherever you are, I'm not sure where. Ah, she's right there. She's coming in from stage left or right, depending which way you're looking. <laughs> Cecilia Rubino. So congratulations on your great success and take it away. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm so delighted uh, to be here with my wonderful old friend uh, and colleague, Frances McDormand. Um, Fran, are you there? Yeah, there she is. She could come out now. Hello. <laughs> um, And uh, just also want to <laughs> just 
want to see what just I'm dealing with. Just see what with. you're dealing with. Yeah. yeah. Um, I just want to thank you. Um, and, you know, again, our condolences to your family. And thank you so Thanks. much. Yeah, for I'm sorry I can be on Monday. But here's to Vernon McDormand. Yes. My poppy. So. M-C-D-O-R-M-A-N-D. That's how you spell it. I spelled it at his funeral, too. <laughs> that's, what I'm, that's what I'm doing around the world, is so, getting everybody to spell it right. So um, I, I don't think I have to introduce you, but I will anyway. Okay. Um, um, Fran uh, McDormand, uh, winner of the Academy Award in 1996 for her brilliant performance in Fargo, the film that's going to be screened um, after, <laughs> after this discussion. Um, and uh, three other Academy Award nominations. And right now, uh, she is starring and giving a devastating and marvelous performance uh, in a Broadway play, a new play called Good People. Uh, she plays a tough Southie from Boston. And um, I would really urge you to go see it. I mean, it's really an astonishing performance, and Thanks. I hope we get a chance to talk about that later. Till the end of May. Um, <laughs> cool. Um, but. Um, to, uh, uh, we were just talking a, a few minutes ago about, I think that her first performance in a noir piece uh, was with me uh, at Yale Drama School uh, many, many years ago. And this is the scenario that I remember. Uh, we were in our final year, and uh, a play called Flash Floods, which was written by a great friend of both of ours, Dare Club, was performing at the Yale Rep. And it was to open, and the night before it opened, the lead actress, who was a femme fatale character, um, called in sick. Fran was her understudy. Uh, everyone thought she would go on with a book, um, but Fran, in about the span of 12 hours, learned the entire part and walked out and executed it flawlessly, brilliantly. Um, I played... I don't remember. <laughs> Um, but, um, uh, and I, I didn't, uh, um, you played the, uh, the sexy one at that point in that piece. Did and, I? Yeah. And what do you, you... Was I sexy? All I remember is, that the, I, rem I don't remember going on that soon, but I do remember that I had to take my shirt off, therefore I had to have a bra on, which I usually don't. That's what I remember about, <laughs> that it was, if I had actually gone through a rehearsal process where I knew I was going to have to do that, it would have been a lot more difficult than just going out and doing it. So, that's what I remember. Well, but I, that playwright is my son's uh, godfather, right. so there you go. Yeah, and, and, and again, I mean, you know, unbelievable precision in terms of being able to uh, walk out there and take that on. As she has gone on for the rest of her career um, that way, uh, this is, we've been enjoying uh, discussions about film noir and neo-noir all week here at the New School, so to just pick up the threads um, of conversations, um, your first film, uh, Blood Simple, which you made right out of Yale, um, is, is a, not a traditional noir film, if you will. We can call it neo-noir. But the character that you played um, is an unwitting femme fatale, if you will. Um, and I'm hoping that you can talk a little bit about the creation of that character. I mean, one thing that characterizes the Coen brother films is um, uh, they are dark. Um, but they also have a wicked sense of humor to them. Mm. But how, how to play a character um, with such authenticity when you're um, in a film that's also commenting on a genre, if you will? Can you talk a little bit about um, creating that character? Yeah, I, I met them in an audition uh, and uh, was not given the whole script. I was only given what we what, what are called sides, so were, were scenes from the film to read over. And at that point, they had already cast the majority of the other actors, and they had me come in, and I read. They liked it. They asked me to come back that later that afternoon to read with the actor who was playing um, Ray in the in the film. And I said, No, I'm sorry, I can't. My boyfriend is uh, has his first job on a soap opera, Vito. Uh, so, someone we went to school with, and I have to see, I have to watch that. And they were both... <laughs> well, would you be willing to come back at four? I said, uh, yeah, I can do that. So they gave me the script, and I went and read it, and we had no training at all in film. 
we at, okay, at drama too. school. We we I think we had one class where John, uh, whose name just went John, John Madden. No. <laughs> anyway, he he brought in a uh, I think he brought in like a Super 8 camera and we stood there and he went like this up and down so we could see what we looked like on film. Yeah, but that that, that was the extent of it. So I took this script home and I remember uh, and I or actually over at Kate's house I went over to Kate's house and I read it and it kept I kept. Blood, the script for Blood Simple, pretty much what you read in the script is on the screen. It may, I think there were two scenes that they eventually cut out. But that's something that, is, that you can count on with Joel and Ethan's films. If you get the published screenplay and you see the film, it's pretty much from page to, 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 uh, to celluloid. Well, it used to be celluloid, whatever it is now. But, um, so, but I, I'm reading this script, and we were never taught how to read a script, a, a film, a screenplay. We were taught how to read plays, and one of the things we were often told to do was just cross out stage directions. Don't, don't read the stage directions, just read the dialogue. So I kept doing that. Well, there's not a lot of dialogue in Blood Simple, so I really didn't know what the heck was going on when I read it. I also kept coming across POV, or what I thought was POV. What's POV? <laughs> Pob this, pob that. I was like, I don't know what pob is. So, and then, you know, and then I get to the scene where, you know, she's stabbing the thing. I'm like, oh my God, it's a slasher. Which is exactly what they intended to do, was make a slasher that was their, was their introduction to, they wanted to introduce themselves as fast as possible to the world of film, and they knew that they could get people's attention that way. So I, 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 and I think that they were, as students of the film, really, really interested in film noir and all the ways that they could subvert that. So as, as Abby, basically what I did was show up. Uh, I was terrified of being too theatrical. So I just stood there until they told me to, do, to move someplace. And I know that afterwards, a, a friend, an old friend saw the film and said, I loved your choice of the kind of, you know, open mouth terror that... <laughs> That's what I would do. That's all I would do. I was so afraid because we, we didn't have any training. So I was afraid that I would move my face too much. So that's how, I de that's how I developed that character. <laughs> I didn't do anything until I was told to do something. Um, you said a long time ago that you actually kept a journal through that period of time. Did I? That's what you said. Who to? To me. Really? Yeah. Uh, you said that things were really shot out of sequence and that taking notes oh, yeah. about um, different, uh, you know, moment to moment about what was going on and, back, you know, your own sort of thinking process, um, but you don't remember that? Yeah, well, I, 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 do have a, I do have an interesting story that I've met, told many times and I think it's still interesting, Beca uh, given, uh, given that out of sequence thing. Um, we, I, I, we, we never had any training in that either, how to uh, sustain the arc of a character through uh, disconnected and out of sequence work that you have to do in a film, especially a low budget film like Blood Simple. Um, so uh, can, I, can I presume that most people here have seen it? So you know what I'm talking about? Okay, so the whole last sequence from where she thinks Marty is, ch uh, is coming to get her. Uh, you know, through the whole kind of, uh, she thinks Marty's alive and coming to, coming to, to uh, kill her. Um, I come to work. I'm having my cigarette, my cup of coffee. It's nine. Joel comes over and says, we're going to be shooting the middle of the sequence where you go into the bathroom after you've seen Ray shot through the window. You think that he's coming up the stairs. You go into the bathroom, and then eventually we're going to shoot you, you know, climbing out the window. And then... So I'm saying, okay, great, yeah. Fuck, fuck. That's, she's really hysterical. She's gotta be really hysterical and uh, take my coffee, okay. So what do I have to do? And I remembered that a uh, play that I've been rehearsing in the last, uh, you know, the last year at drama school, the, uh, I think it was um, Lynn Seifert's Coyote Ugly. Sure, yeah. And the director, who I don't know who was directing at the time, but uh, wanted me to be at a certain hysterical pitch at one point in rehearsal. Oh my God, that was me. 
Isn't that Graf, Graf Mallon? Uh, I don't remember. No, it was yeah. a woman. It was a woman director. But she got she got one of she got Basarab, a, a, another actor in it who's quite large, to hold me from behind. And she said, "Don't let her go." And then she said, "Fran, fight to get out of his arms, and don't let her go until I believe she's at the place that she needs to be for to start the scene." And I remembered that it pissed me off so bad, and I be, I did become hysterical that I that fucking let me let me go. And, and it got me someplace, so I said, I, I looked around the set, I saw the strongest guy who was Tom, uh, this guy Tom, who was the, also the oldest man on the set, I think he was 35, and I went up to him and I said, look, could you hold, hold me from behind until Joel says action. I know it's going to be weird, I'm going to struggle to get away, but don't let me go until he says action. And he did, he went, yes ma'am. It was very nice, and he didn't, didn't ask me any other questions, he just held me, and everybody, I remember everybody was like, okay. And they never made a movie, Joel and Ethan never made a movie, they didn't know, but they thought, oh, this is what an actor does to prepare. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> and then I thought, then, then I knew I had to, I had to, then they said we'd be shooting this all day, all day. All yeah. day, and I'm going, in my mind, how do I do that? So I just crawled under a table with a box of Kleenex. Well, actually, I didn't take the Kleenex. The hair and makeup person went like this under the table. With the, and I stayed under there all day. Joel would ca crawl down under the table and say, OK, the next thing we're doing, or the, it's only on your hand, so you really don't have to uh, be hysterical. If, but if, if you want to be, that's OK. It was a one-camera shoot. We've been together for 29 years. Yeah. Uh, I married him. Um, that was a one-camera shoot then? Was huh? it a one-camera shoot? It was a one-camera shoot, yes. Where, uh, Barry Sonnenfeld, who has now gone on to uh, great acclaim, uh, Adam's Family, <laughs> one of his other films, many really great films. He's now a director, but he, yeah, he operated the camera. Well, there are not a lot of DPs that do, but I think yeah. the best of them do. Um, the, noir has figured in the Coen Brother films in many ways. Yes. And uh, um, so leaping forward to the, the, uh, uh, the man that wasn't there, mm -hmm. you play a real noir babe uh, um, uh, character. Bitch, the bitch. Yeah. yeah. Well, with capital T and B. But, um, but again, still with dropped in authenticity. Uh, so how do you play an archetype? Well, that's what that, I mean, that's what's been really, uh, the fortunate thing of being a, a member of their, uh, of their company. Because I, I, like I was saying to Cecilia, Joel and Ethan uh, work with a company of actors. There's some filmmakers that do, many don't, but they often write for specific actors right. and reuse a lot of actors. And I've been, I don't necessarily know that I would have ever gotten the opportunity to play some of the roles I've played if it wasn't for having been a member of their company. Because I'm not the, I'm not what is generally seen as a, a femme fatale in the film business. Uh, but they've written those roles. And I think because I'm not really perfectly cast in those roles, that's why they seem more subversive and why they were interested in me doing them. But how do you, how do you what's your process though when you're taking on a character like that, that, that babe character? Uh, the babe? Mm -hmm. Well, with that one, it was about the hair. <laughs> was very important. Seriously, The it hair, is. not very... the accent. Uh, in what? In Man Who Wasn't There? Yeah. I didn't have an accent. No, I know. But... <laughs> yeah, just... and it, uh, in that one it was hair, although, um, yeah, it was definitely the hair. We had a wig made. She was, to, she was an Italian-American woman, and so we wanted to go dark. Well, I was playing, um, the man whose brother I was playing was, uh, was an, Af uh, an African-American. No, he was an Italian-American. And he had dark hair. And so I had a dark wig made. And then because of it was a black and white film, when we got to the camera test, uh, it just looked like I had a large animal sitting on my head. <laughs> So then we decided to go with uh, my real hair, which at the time was, was bleached blonde, and that's what we did. And so she became a blonde femme fatale rather than a brunette femme fatale. What was interesting about the, the filming of that is that it was actually shot in color and then transferred to black and white later, um, which was a choice 
by the DP and Joel and Ethan to make the black and whites even richer because at the time, black and white film hadn't been used for so long. It wasn't really, you, you could get a lot more depth in, by using color and then desaturating it later. So that's how they did that. So everybody on the set was walking around with these black and white uh, graded color charts from white to black, all through all colors of gray. And people would walk around and put it up to your face, put it down to your clothes, put it to things. But it was a beautiful film. I think it's a gorgeous black and white film. And one of the reasons they wanted to do it was they, because they wanted to do a black and white film and tell, be able to tell a story that way, which yeah. I think it's very different. Um, um, you still didn't answer the question about yeah, creating character. Yeah, ask me more specific, something more specific. Well, well let, let's, let's, hop, let's hop over, because I mean, I didn't mean the, the accent part, or what's the portal in terms of entering a, a, a character? Uh, whether well, it's it really a, is physical for me. Uh, it, 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 and, but but what also what's great with Joel and Ethan's scripts is they're so, it, they're not blueprints, which a lot of screenplays are. They are actual artifacts. They are literary pieces of work. You don't, they, you don't improvise. We don't improvise. You learn, you learn it like a, a like a theater, like a like a play. So well, can I ask more though? Surely, uh, um, and and just having written a piece with actors and having actors in the rehearsal process, adding so much, um, you know, here and there, and changing lines. Um, are they scrupulous about you speaking the text as it's written? Yes. And you're not adding it. You're no. not doing the Meryl Streep, uh, Kramer, Kramer thing where she's inventing the monologue. No. No. I mean, I've done that with uh, with countless other directors and in countless other situa situations where the, the, the scripts are just plain not finished and have to be finished. And more often than not, I'm playing the roles, a, a, a female supporting role to a, the male protagonist whose story it is that's just underwritten. And so sometimes they do need me to help because it's so poorly written. So they need me to improvise just to make it alive. And with Joel and Ethan, you do not have to do that. If anything, I mean, the only time that I've ever really been in a situation with them where something has been changed is with Fargo. And be, uh, I, don't, I don't want you to, I, I think you'll be involved with the process of watching the film, but just for your information. In the scene where I'm interrogating John, uh, Jerry Lundegaard uh, right before he flees the interview, I had a, uh, a, it was the first scene we shot. And I had worked on the accent, I learned the accent with the script the rhythm of the script. So it wasn't really easy for me to improvise with that accent because I really learned it with the lines. But it, it was a rhythm thing that was a part of the script too because both Joel and Ethan are from Minnesota and know that accent and, and we're using the music of that accent. So I got into it and I couldn't remember one of the lines because I had learned how to do the accent with a smile on my face and that was the easiest way. And the minute I got into situations where Marge wasn't smiling, it was really hard to, it just dropped away. So Ethan helped me because he could tell that there was a rhythm thing going on in it that I needed a couple extra words. And, and it, it, you can't really break down their, th what they do, but if you can break it down, if you can delineate it at all, Joel is visual and Ethan is words. And then their brains kind of do a mind meld outside their bodies, but, 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 <laughs> Generally speaking, Ethan is the one who's listening in that way and mm. could tell that the so in the, that way, having the writer on set, but pretty much their 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 world as a writer stops the minute they begin the production. Wow, they, uh, or they try to talk about March for a second though, mm -hmm. because um, and 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 again, you'll have to forgive me, but. I can't watch the film without hearing Jane Kaczmarek coming out of your mouth. And Jane is from Wisconsin, but um, um, there's a little Wisconsin that melds into Minnesota. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, that accent. It's there. beautiful. Yeah. It's also a cultural thing. The nice thing. Yeah. Is something we know okay. about Jane. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, but 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 what besides the exterior, besides the learning the speech patterns pattern and the cadence of her. What else in terms of creating that character and the range of things that she goes through in that film? Um, did you research? I mean, they're from Minnesota. Did you camp out in Minnesota? What did no. you do to create the character? Uh, the only thing that I really did in a research, I'm not a great research person, but the one thing I did do that I wanted to be, I wanted to feel, I wanted to be uh, conscientious to was shooting a gun. I wanted to make sure that she was a woman who 
did not have to use her weapon a lot, but when she did, she was good at it. So I didn't, because I really hate when you go to a film, especially when women are using guns, I hate when they're like, like that. I hate that. I, it's wrong, it's just wrong, especially for someone whose profession is about you being able to right. feel comfortable with their firearm. I also think that women in that society are comfortable with firearms at an early age. So uh, I went to a shooting range, and that was great, and because I also spent some time, I know, this, now I remember, I spent time with a female cop who was six months pregnant, and that was great, because she took me to the firing range. I was very concerned for her unborn fetus, <laughs> because it was so fucking loud, but she didn't seem to be concerned. She was still working, which I also got a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, a lot of uh, great, um, you know, it was great spending time with her because of course she was still working. She had to keep working, and most women do, up until they give birth at many jobs. And uh, the, the, this, this, the, the um, you know, the misconception that women are in, in a weakened state because they're pregnant. In fact, it's probably the strongest most women are unless there, there are medical complications with their pregnancy. It's the strongest that they, women can be physically. And in fact, should be working up until they, they or their doctor says they shouldn't. So she was, she was, on, she was on a desk job. She decided because she was in the narcotics squads. So she was no longer, you know, ramming down doors of narcotics dealers, which I think was probably a good choice. But um, she, the only real thing that had changed was she couldn't wear her uniform anymore because there wasn't a maternity uniform available to her. <laughs> Mine were made. Yeah. Can you tell the bra story about that? Yeah, I, I, the, the, that was a really interesting physical transformation for me because um, um, and what I think what became iconic about the character and what I'm the most proud of about that character is that she was a pregnant woman doing her job and then she just ended up being a person doing her job. And that's what I love about. And I think that that's what became, that's what kind of became, um, it, it, you know, okay, so th that's what I believe about that. The, um, the uh, it was very complicated, the whole, uh, playing a, a, a pregnant woman at that time for me because I had been attempting to get pregnant for about three years before that. So I think that if I had gotten a script unsolicited from someone else to play a pregnant character, I would have said, no, thank you very much. I think I'll wait. But I didn't think about it until I got on the set and was at lunch one day in my little pregnant outfit and people were going, oh, eating for two now? And, blah, blah, blah. and then all the pregnant jokes were coming out and it was like, Fuck me. <laughs> and I uh, wasn't really sure if I wanted to go ahead with it. Luckily, yet again, luckily, I was working with the father of my child <laughs> in more ways than one. And we knew that in two months after that, we knew that we were go going to become parents of our son, who is now 16, who we met two months after we finished the film. Uh, and. We started our family, and almost everybody on the film knew we were starting our family. His godmother is the costume designer. At the end of the film, when, when uh, Norm says to Margie, two more months, Marge, two more months, everybody on the scene was, you know, sobbing because we all knew that in two more months we were going to meet Pedro. So there was a, there's a real, when I call it our family movie, it really is our family movie. We weren't pregnant, but we were expecting, and that had a lot to do with, I believe, Joel and Ethan are terrified of sentiment. Not terrified, that's not fair. They don't use sentiment. They refuse to use sentiment. No, they refuse to be sentimental. They use sentiment like, in a, I mean, they're great with sentiment and have become even better, uh, therefore, the success of True Grit. I think yeah. it's, it's truly the best use of sentiment in film right now. Sentimental, no. That's why it worked. It was, it, I think that, that that's why, you know, when, I, when people, uh, little old ladies come up to me on the street and say, I just love that movie. I love Fargo. It's my favorite movie. And I go, do you remember the body count? <laughs> remember how many people die of like horrible means in that film? Yeah, but I don't care. I just love it. It's great. Because what you, what you at really end with 
re regardless, is this feeling of life expectancy and, and good hope and hope and truth and future, even though it's about a lot of stupid, stupid people that do very stupid things. You, you, didn't, you didn't tell the story. It's about um, your, Oh, my, uh, my breast exploded. Yeah, the, yeah. Uh, the cold. I wore, uh, very, very early on, I was given, um, and this is, this, we can tie this back into noir, because I believe noir has a lot of large-breasted women. I thought just, we'll make that a part, since we sh we're supposed to be talking about to noir. <laughs> I got my first pair of prosthetic breasts for Raising Arizona, uh, and I've used them on and off ever since. They're a really great tool, <laughs> like a, a nose or a wig or a, you know anything, that, anything else. Prosthetic breasts are great, and I used them for uh, Marge, and they they froze and burst one night, and not on me, but they burst in the um, makeup and hair trailer. We came back to burst breasts because of the freezing cold. So that just, anybody interested in implants, think about it, don't go to a very cold. <laughs> um, I don't know what, what, what time we're on. Liz, are you around? I am around. Okay. See, you'll, I told you I could talk, Liz. Uh, um, but um, uh, I, just to step back for a second um, and, and talking about, I mean, one of the reasons why I, I think that you're an inspiration to actors and you're an actor's actor is because you've uh, engaged in the industry on your own terms. And, and particularly uh, um, as someone who, as a woman who's worked uh, her entire career nonstop, uh, can you talk about a little bit about your own mindset or how you've managed to survive so brilliantly? Well, I, I, I have to, I have to I, full disclosure right up front, I uh, have been really fortunate to have a partner who also works. And so I feel that to a certain extent, Joel Cohen uh, has subsidized the American theater because that's one of the only ways, if I had been a single mother, I probably wouldn't have made, been able to make the same choices that I have. Yeah. But I have been able to make the choices I have, which means to do, I've been able to do avant-garde theater, regional theater, I've been able to do small independent films as well as Transformers 3, which is coming out July 11, uh, 1st. <laughs> you know, and I can make the choice to do Transformers 3 because I want to be in a large franchise movie, not because we need the money. We've kept our overhead really low. That's also something I think that's given me a lot more choices. Our lifestyle is not extravagant, and so I know that I, you know, I, I'm, not at the, I'm not at the mercy of a lifestyle. My lifestyle is my work, so I also have the freedom of taking two years off at a time if I want, it, which I did uh, a couple years ago because I knew it was important for, for my son. So in terms of choices, I've always been able to make choices because of something I want, not be, because of something I have to do or have been told to do. If anything, I've always been able to make choices uh, against what is the expectation. And so I basically I built my profession on trying to um, uh, keep you guessing. Or keep yourself And keep myself keep guessing. guessing. Yeah. yeah. But, but uh, um, you know, the, the Many actors return to the stage. Many film actors come from a, a stage background. I'd love to talk about some of the differences between stage and film acting uh, at some point. But most actors uh, don't come back to the stage and do a wacky downtown Wooster group. Um, really, really challenging texts. And you've done that, and I just want you to talk a little bit about that kind of work and what it's offered to you as an actor in your film work. Yeah, it's great. It's, it's one of the best, best way. It's right in the middle between film and theater because, it's, because Liz is interested in telling her stories that way. It's, complete, it's multimedia. It has a lot of film. It has a lot of... It, uh, it, it's the extravagance of everything. It's, a, it's the full use of film, camera, on stage, live action filming, videotaped, uh, live action performance. It's everything. So for me, it's, and it's also, I realized v uh, uh, early on that it's very hard to go from the very small muscular world of cinema to the very large muscular world of 
uh, stage acting. And you can't presume as an actor that you can go back and forth that easily. It's like, you know, doing, uh, I, I, I attempted to do um, Moon for the Misbegotten. What's her name? Yeah. The, the uh, character, thank you. Josie yeah. and Moon for the Misbegotten after not having done a play for two and a half years. And it was, it was ridiculous. It was like trying to run a marathon after having walked around the block a couple times. You don't take on something like that without training and that's something that Liz understands. She puts her actors into a training program where in the piece that I developed with the, that I was part of the, the development of with the Worcester Group, we did it over a period of two years. We trained first with a, uh, and it was, it was, it was called To the Birdie, but it was based on Racine's Phaedra, an uh, English adaptation of the French uh, classic Phaedra. And uh, we first worked with a Chinese Olympic ping pong coach. Then we worked with a Chinese Olympic badminton coach. Yeah, there's an incredible uh, badminton scene in the piece, um, um, which Fran is like volleying back and forth with it, without it ever dropping. Um, I'm just assuming that, that everybody knows that the Worcester Group is an experimental theater downtown, uh, um, and so just to give it, contextualize it. Uh, yeah, um, it, they've been uh, a company for 35 years, and they take on associate artists such as myself, and so I worked within the development for two, for two years, and then um, it uh, that training basically we trained so that so that uh, when put into the the she because she restages things over a period of time. It, it's a great process. We would work for two months, then they would go, uh, I would go do a film, they would go uh, traveling with another piece around the world, we would come back and work for another two months. So over two year, a two year process. But, but we were always knew what, what, we were, what was expected of us physically because of the training that we did. And I learned a lot about that and have been able to um, use that for my work and other things. I think a lot scarier for me now actually is a, a run of a Broadway show like what I'm doing now. I, I, I'm not suited to Broadway because it's a corporate world and I'm not suited to that. I'm not suited to doing things for a long amount of time. Three months is my limit and I'm doing this for five and, and I'm very fortunate in the play that we're doing that it's gonna, I'm gonna be able to do it for that long but I, I, it, it's stretching my well, it's also, it's a really difficult role. Yeah, but, um, but, but so cathartic, it's not as difficult as some. Um, can you talk about um, this, the, again, I think the difference between film and theater is also has so much to do with the audience. And watching you on stage, uh, I was just really struck again about how comfortable and easy and uh, um, the reciprocity with the audience is. I mean, it's a, it's a, it, this is good people on Broadway right now. So it's a, it's a difficult, tragic role in so many ways, but it's very, very funny play. You, of course, are always very funny. You are. Um, but it's the, t it's the timing. It's the, it's the having that sense of being able to, f to feel and, and, and have uh, uh, a sense of your audience. And how do you develop that? Or how have you developed that? that uh... <laughs> so this, uh, I'll tell you what happens when that happens. Cause, yeah, no, but, but that happens a lot in the theater now. So much more than, than even two years ago when I was doing a play. Because we are so uh, inured to it. That's, those sounds happen all the time now. And also because we check them so much. It's like you're always, like, always on them. People don't even hear, please turn off your ba ba ba. So there's always at least two to three um, cell phones that go off. And so here, I, for better or worse, and I, and I need your feedback because I'm not asking anybody. I continue, but I go like this. <laughs> and I'll continue my lines and it's like until it goes off and then I know because there's no point in pretending like we don't hear it and if you're in a scene where it's clear nobody has a cell phone <laughs> and nobody you know like in this scene where there's a six-year-old girl asleep upstairs she's the only one who could have a cell phone at that point so it's like mm -mm. you're the one with the cell phone I'm not don't mean to, to, to because doesn't it but you know so get it take care of that now okay that's good so if you can stay alive to it, but it's, it's not just cell phones. It's also sometimes, you know, you got, you got somebody out there who's like hacking up the like phlegm from the bottom of their feet. And you know you've got something coming up. If, they, if the audience doesn't hear this line, they're not going to get the next two hours. If they don't hear that word, it comes, if that comes right, so you're like, 
<laughs> so, I'm, so sometimes you take, I literally have to, I think, he's going to call now. Okay, say that. Okay. <laughs> so you have to. And it becomes a part, and then it also, instead of, if, if you pretend it's not there, then the audience has to pretend it's not there, but they can't. It's a part of the process. So it's, that, that, that's become something when I was younger, I was not. I was very distrustful at audiences. I didn't like, in fact, I loved the, the process of rehearsal and hated performing because I hated having to honor the fact that you were there and that you were going to control some part of it. Now I love it. I love it. When did that shift? How does that shift? It shifted with the Worcester Group. I think a lot of it shifted. It also shifted when I was going back and forth from the isolation of film work yeah. back into the community of theater. And, and, and um, when I was able to actually, when it really shifted is when I was able to stand in a curtain call and know that that's why I was there. That's why I'm there. I want to be, I want to be worshipped and adored. <laughs> Eight times a week, I'll take it. 650 strangers, bring it on. And so the work that has to be done to achieve that, then it becomes different kind of work. And not everybody gets worshipped and adored every time they do their job. So I I'm, I'm, I'm feel very fortunate to have the kind of job that gets immediate, gets immediate gratification like that. Um, the isolation of film and not being trained in that medium in any kind of way. Um, um, in fact, uh, I, I don't... I, I'm wondering if we were trained really in any kind of way except yeah. training each other. Yeah. Um, um, well, just full disclosure, we had three years together at, at Yale Drama School, uh, sweating out every morning um, in a dance class, but, but pretty much together with the same group of people for um, um, <laughs> that, that long period of time. Yeah. Um, and and uh, one of the stories that I tell my students is uh, when we were in our final year, John Madden, who went on to direct Shakespeare in Love, was our Shakespeare teacher. And he would show up for class and he would go, so uh, what do you guys want to do today? And that was our training. Yeah. Um, and every class was actually amazing because the, the co collective was so focused. Um, but we weren't trained in any particular methodology or um, approach, if you will. And routinely after that, um, in my early years teaching, uh, people would ask me, uh, what do you teach? What method do you teach? Do you teach Meisner? Do you teach Adler? Do you teach Strasberg? And I very cavalierly would say, I don't teach any of them, they're dead. Um, um, but uh, it's a living medium, mm -hmm. and I am deeply informed by history and, 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 the, 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 and honor those that come before me. Um, but it, it, again, it's inventing and reinventing every time you're- Yeah, it can't you're, be reverential. You have to be, it has to be alive. Um, but I was struck when uh, John Totoro and his wife Kathy Borowitz came into one of my acting classes uh, a year or two ago, and um, he was saying, no, in fact, he really went back after Yale and, and studied Meisner, 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 Meisner. Was there any other uh, training beyond your own teaching or beyond Joel and Ethan teaching you uh, um, that you engaged in. And, I get, and you've talked about the Wooster Group, so I know mm -hmm. that that's a, a, mm -hmm. a, another. You mean film? With film? Right, with film or even with your own process as an actor. Um, um, did you work with anyone else? Did you train with anyone else? No, I pretty much, because like most of us, our class was, was extraordinary in the fact that almost all of us came straight from college. So. After that seven years, I really never wanted to go into a classroom again. But I have, I think that, that, that now that I look back at it, I think what I did was um, I, 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 I worked all the time. So that was, that was my continuing training. But I also have had, my physical life didn't really start until Wesley Fathas class, this movement class that Cecilia's talking about. That was really the most, what most, uh, profound training I got yeah. was, was, was just go, thinking of myself from the neck down. I mean, I was doing a lot of things from my neck down. <laughs> but I didn't really uh, know how to you know, access it. I, intellectually, there was a cutoff. There was a cutoff. And I started, it wasn't until that three years where that's when, it, that's when my physical life began. And I've kept that. I think that over the last 30 years, I have tried every single form of exercise ever invented. 
every trend, every fad. Never been really good at it or consistent, but I've tried them all. Yeah, I'll do that. You know, I'll do that kind of thing and I'll do that kind of thing. So what's kept me connected to a, a consistency is knowing that I've got to count on this in some way. Yeah. Now, when I, I, you know, it, it remains to be seen day by day if I can touch my toes, but I always make the attempt. And so I have to, I, be, I, I believe that that, uh, if anything, it's the, yeah, it was that uh, Kutowski? Physi physical process. You can, yeah. you can call it whatever instrument. you want. It's got to be, yeah. it's got to be tuned to a certain pitch. And then, you, you know, so that you can, you can count on it. Yeah. Um, I want to um, open it up to all of you guys out here because I know uh, that there are many students that have questions. Um, so if you have a question, there are these two lovely... And it has to be all about noir. <laughs> uh, or I won't answer it. <laughs> microphone over here. Kidding. So, so um, um, just opening it up. And if you don't have any questions, I've got a million more. So uh, here, Marquette, can you come on, come take the mic? No, I just talk, speak. Try to project. I, speak I can hear you. Um, so I am curious, as an actor, both film and stage, like, like, what do you look for in an director? What do you want from a director? Uh, I, uh, because I think probably because I started with Joel and Ethan, uh, e uh, Joel started as an editor. And Ethan started as a writer, and then they they become filmmakers. So what I'm really interested, I do not trust a, a, a film director who whose reputation is being good with actors. That's that's really great for theater. Uh, that's really great for classwork. For um, I, I want to, I like to work with directors who know how they're going to edit the film because I believe that film is an editor's medium. I don't think it's an actor's medium. It's not a director's medium. It's an editor's medium. If an, if a director knows, has an idea of what that final pro, pro, product is going to be, then he knows or she knows how to use me. Does that answer your question? Uh, technically, yeah. for film, it's technical. Like I don't really need. Uh, uh, I, I think that the, the expertise I bring to it is the psychological truth. That that if I've been, I've, uh, at least when I'm cast properly, if I've been if I've been miscast or I, I or I, I I'm, I'm I'm delusional about what I think I can do, then it doesn't. It's just not going to work. But I'd much rather. What I learned or also early is for somebody to say, you need to do this faster, you need to do it slower, you need to, you know, just, it's technical. I don't really, you know, I don't really, uh, I, think it's, I think it's dangerous in film, especially if people are rewriting a script, to count too much on uh, uh, the subtext of an actor, because subtext isn't dramatic. It's great to maybe discuss, but it, you, you shouldn't, uh, rehearse a scene in a film and then shoot a scene in a film if you want it, if you don't understand what the dramatic arc of it is in the, a larger thing. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah. So I, I've, done, I've done some things where, I, you know, a couple actors, I'm rehearsing with a couple other actors and we really get it going and said, the director's like, that's so fantastic. It's, yeah, don't trust it. It's all subtext. It's great once, but maybe not more than once. So, yeah, an editor. I want somebody to know what they're doing. And it's, it would be, it's nice if they know technically what they're doing. You know? Like, uh, uh, it, it, yeah, I won't go. I won't name names. <laughs> Tess. Mm-hmm. Tell me about it. So, so, so how do you find that kind of visceral response with, without that activity? Pretend. <laughs> this, I tell you, look, that's the, you know why you wanted to be an actor? I pretended. I pretended. I played with myself a lot. Well, I played alone <laughs> a lot as a child and had whole pioneer women scenarios going like for days and days and days. So that was a big part of it for me was just pretending and, and that's what it is. And, and you know, the idea that, that uh, you know, uh, like with the, with the play that I'm doing right now, I, I did, I, 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 Boston's three hours away on the train. 
I didn't have to go to Boston. I have to live inside the play. And I'm really inside the play. And so when you come to the world of the play, you're coming to the world that I live in. And, I'm gonna, and, I, and I, I believe it, so you're going to believe it. So on a film set, um, you know, if, I'm, if I have to talk to a piece of tape on the wall, because that's what they need for an eye line, then you talk to that piece of tape on the wall, right? If I can be there for an actor just to the left of that piece of tape, I'll be there, and, you know, you, you take what you get, but it's pretending. Don't you, I mean, it's the power of pretending. Um, I don't want it to. I don't want it to be. I don't want it to be glib about it, though. Um, I think uh, that's where the editor comes in as well, though. I think that it also, you know, with with uh, what I always loved about watching when Joel and Ethan actually cut on film, which they no longer do, and uh, not many people do, is that there's a breath. There, there's a physical contact with celluloid when you have to cut it with a little knife that, that has a lot more to do with what, I, what an actor is doing on a set, is that a breath can, can change your performance entirely. And so to have to make that decision to cut something, to cut it there or there, as opposed to, you know, looking, you know, Final Cut Pro, it's a different thing. It's a different thing. There's not a breath to... Uh, a digital, uh, digital film as there is to a celluloid film. I don't think. I, I regret that. Yes. Have you ever begun a project and then, in the, in the effort, realized it wasn't? Yeah, it's horrible. Well. Yeah, shall, shall I tell you? I, I can, I'll, I'll pick one for example. Uh, the, I, three years ago, I did a, a Broadway production of the revival of, a, of a, a Clifford Odette's play called The Country Girl. And um, it's, uh, it, it's a bit clunky, but a very interesting play. But it was a lot more interesting on, on paper than it ended up being in the process. So let me tell you what was on paper. You've got a Clifford o revival of a Clifford Odets play that hasn't been done for quite some time. So uh, the, the assumption that a lot of audiences won't know it. It's a, a you know, 1930s fast talking play about the theater. Mike Nichols is directing. Morgan Freeman is starring at, in a role that was not written for a black man to play. Uh, myself playing his wife. 19, uh, so it took place in the 1950s, 1950s, so then now we have a interracial couple in the 1950s. Um, it's uh, called The Country Girl, so I was under some delusion that it was, the play was about me, because I was playing The Country Girl. Uh, and it's on Broadway. It was, we were all, it was, it was totally mis miscast, it was totally misrehearsed. It was uh, a, a bad production and we had to do it for four months and that was really difficult. Now within that there were astounding things happening. I mean you can't be on a stage with Morgan Freeman and Peter Gallagher and the other people in that in that production and not have m moments of sheer joy but as a whole endeavor it was cursed and that was really hard to do eight times a week. And I now know because of the experience I'm in and how perfectly joyous it is, how hard that really was. So, yeah, you know, you do your job. You show up, you're there, you do your job. Sure. It's a job. Uh, Hang oh. on one second here, somebody behind you just. <laughs> Um, I go a lot on um, serendipity. Often I get, the, it, it's what comes along, it's, a, a, it's like at the right time type thing. Uh, it's usually trying to do something that's the, the exact opposite of the last thing I did. Um, there's not many of those left. After working for 30 years, there's not many that new choices to be had, especially in the world of a female actor. But, um, you know, trying to just trying to, change it up. I mean, not a lot of people looking at my resume would think that I would do Transformers 3, but that's exactly why I did. 
and it was great. I loved it. Isn't isn't Totoro in that too? Yes, I did Sean. it. Yes, and he he upstaged me mercilessly <laughs> every <laughs> chance <laughs> he could get. <laughs> Huh. And everybody else. Um, no, he's, it's, it was fantastic because I actually play uh, a, a, a person who his characters had. A I play his love interest of sorts, so that was really good. But it was also one of the most macho things I've ever done in my life. I le literally, at one point, was sprinting. I sprinted. I'm 53. <laughs> I don't sprint. I walk long distances, I don't sprint, but it was like, yeah, I was like, over and over and over again. I was like so messed up the next like three weeks, like my knees were so messed up, but it's just like the testosterone was pumping on this set. It was just the Navy SEALs and the trucks and the cars. It was like, yeah, I'll sprint. It was like sprinting. If that gets cut out of the movie, I'll be so pissed. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, the, you were, had a question. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask you, are there any um, stage roles that you would like to play that you have? Yeah, see, well, that, that's something actually I wanted to bring up when we were talking about the Worcester Group. Because I have, you know, when we, when we started, when we got out of drama school in 82, there was not, you didn't really cross over. There weren't a lot of uh, interdisciplinary actions taking place. You did theater, you did film, or you did television. Not a lot of people, as, in fact, I remember the first real crossover that, that I became aware of was Tom Hanks going from Bosom Buddies to film. And it was like, wow, that's, that, that's interesting. And so, so, and then, and then now, but now, you know, uh, uh, it, uh, and it's not easy to do, but a lot of, a lot of actors uh, that are, who are maybe 20 years younger than me have, have careers in everything. They're doing everything, so, which is great. Uh, but really early, I realized, like I was saying, you can't just out of nowhere decide to do Desdemona. So you can't be doing, necessarily though, it would be interesting to do the days of our lives for three years and then do Desdemona. That's probably better training than most things would be. <laughs> but for me to play the classical roles, I need, I've got to do, do those classical roles with, with companies like the Worcester Group. I'm not, I'm not, I don't have the, I haven't, the, you know, there's kind of a, the roles are, are there, or you, 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 you can grow up through the Shakespeare canon. You can grow up through the classical plays. You can grow up through, I played all three sisters in Three Sisters. Uh, backwards. Backwards, I started with Olga at drama school and then, <laughs> then did Arena and then Masha. I would like to do on Fesis someday. I've missed Natasha, yeah. but there you go. But there, you know, to, you, you kind of have to do the, stone, the stepping stones towards those, the great iconic female characters and male characters. So I, 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 I look for ways to subvert it then. You know, I, did, I didn't play Phaedra. I played an, uh, a known in Phaedra, but I don't think I could, I could really take on uh, a role in a classical um, production of Phaedra. I, t I tell I you the role that I'm playing. That. Yeah, I I'll you know, depending on, on what the what the what the concept for the play was and who the director was. But I feel like Maggie Walsh, the play, the character I'm playing now, is going to live in the pantheon. Hedda, Stella, Blanche, Maggie Walsh, from South Boston. He's written a role for a, a 50 year old female actor that is yes, is hits all you know. the big, all the big. Don't you think? Yeah. So. So how do you keep her fresh every night, though? It's not a movie. Uh, no, but it's... How, how does it, how does it, well, how do you I, do it? it it's, 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 it's been a profound experience for me because literally, maybe it's, it has something to do with my age, but literally sometimes I don't know what's, when it comes next. And uh, that, so that's a joy of losing your mind and your, your capacity for retention. But there's also, the, it's also the brilliance of David Lindsay Bear's play. There is a, there is a, uh, it, it is a well-written play. You don't have to search. I don't have to be spending a lot of my time connecting the dots. They, it just rolls out. It rolls out. And I think that that's true for all the characters. Um, but for me, it is uh, staying really connected physically to the present moment at all times. If Fran burps up the Thai food she had at 4.30, 
so does Margie Walsh. I'm aware of my physical life in this character in a way that I haven't been before. Or, or I felt that I've had to, I've had to um, not, uh, not make it known how, my, how connected I am to my, my the, what's happening. On a, on a, mm. And there's, there's, uh, there's jet. I also feel, I don't feel, um, I'm not afraid of, uh, I'm not afraid of, okay, I'll give you a, a, a really, a really specific example. There's a, there's a line in the play that um, is so perfectly constructed that it, uh, has moved me, to, given me an emotional catharsis every single time I've said the sentence out loud. And for many, for many weeks, I was afraid to acknowledge that, articulate that to anyone, because then I thought I would curse it. You know, these superstitions that we actors have. Oh, I better not say anything about it. It'll never happen again. Then uh, a, 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 a friend, I was discussing it with a friend, and I said the sentence out loud. And then I went back, and it still worked. And then, <laughs> then I started talking to other people about that sentence. And then I dis tried to articulate what that sentence was doing to me and where it was connected to, and it still continued to work. And if, and if anything, got even richer and deeper. And that sentence is, I'll give two sentences. It is, it wasn't my job to find you, not when you knew where we were. Not when you knew where we were. The construction of that sentence is like a tapeworm that pulls shit from the bot, like the down there, all the way up through the nervous system and out my mouth, and is connected to very, very, a very personal place for me, but then a completely universal place for the audience. And uh, to, 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 that's the brilliance of, uh, of uh, and the mystery of great writing. Yeah. And 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 I've, I'm having right now. I'm the only actress that's ex having the experience of that line, but millions more will, and they're gonna. F and I can't wait to find out. I can't. You know, the, what, what happened to you? <laughs> What it was to do, right? Cool. Well, when you those W's, it's gorgeous. Hang on a second. We'll get a question from the back there. Yeah, oh. right. You, yes. Um, who have been some of your favorite actors and directors to work with, and who would you still like to work with? Yeah, that's hard um, because I I really do have a short attention span, and I've never also never really been even when I was younger. I didn't have a lot of um, you know I didn't have like I, I, I didn't look towards other actors and actresses, though I have to say in, in my early days and still, two people, two actors that were, I, I, I recognized something in were Peter Sellers and Charles Lawton. For some reason I would watch them and go, oh. <laughs> you know, I would, they would be like, and then to find out, you know, that they were personal was like shits. They were both just horrible people, like. <laughs> But as from some weird, uh, uh, they just seemed really familiar to me. Act uh, females, um, I think harder because uh, I, I, I don't, I never thought of emulating people. It was more about recognizing people. In terms of wanting to work with uh, other people now, um, uh, it's a hard question. I, I, I well, just want to keep working. Yeah, but you've also been working with young female directors recently, yeah, which I is had amazing, the, and championing the work of, of women in film, which has been... Yeah, um, I mean, I had one, in, in two years, I had the opportunity to work with five female directors, and that for, uh, you know, for, uh, for at least for our generation. That was an extraordinary gift, to know, for one thing, that there was five, five female directors working in film. <laughs> Yeah. and being given money to make yeah. film, and that they were so disparately different, going from Nancy Myers, who I, I personally do not like her films, but I, I, I really, really admire the fact that she is one of the highest paid directors and has made some of the, the most uh, largest grossing films. That's a very important thing 
for female filmmakers. It's because it is a business. So it's really important that uh, our films make money so that we get to make more of them. Uh, and then, you know, uh, young, really, really um, experimental filmmakers like uh, Karen Kusama and Nikki Caro and N Nicole Hollisoner and Lisa Cholodenko. All I worked with all of those people in the in the span of a couple of years. I was like, pig and shit, it was the best thing. Great. Yes. Do you want to stand up to ask you a question? Great. Yes. Um, there's more, there, uh, she asked if I have to try out, so uh, the, the auditioning process is different now. It's a lot more, uh, it's not as uh, evident, but yes, I do. It's not going necessarily going into a room and reading from a script with people, but it's still, there's still a vetting process, as it were. And uh, because um, so much, especially for a female actor in the film business and in theater, is so much is is un unfortunately predicated on what you look like. That uh, they have to, you know, it's like, well, we're, we're, we just we we would love to just get together and talk. But what they really are doing is like finding out if you you know can still walk, you know, how many chins you have, you know, how close are they are they going to have to put Vaseline on the lens? Can she, you know, still play, you know, the girlfriend of a male ten years, fifteen or years twenty years older than her? You know, it's outrageous. I mean, most of the most of the men who I've played opposite have been old enough to be my father. I, for years, I was playing the girlfriend or wife of all the male movie stars that were 15 years older than me, 20 years older than me. I made it really good, I had a really good run with that actually. So yes, yeah, so in terms of vetting, there's a vetting process. I did, like for this play, um, I did a reading, of, a reading of it for the theater and the playwright a year ago. And though it wasn't an audition, it certainly was a, a, a test to see if the material, the performer and the, you know, the time was right. And, Thankfully, it worked out. Cool. So yeah, I do get offered things, but generally, I still think there's a there's a process of. Yeah, in the back there, you yes. Thank you. Good. He's bringing it back on point. Thank you. <laughs> really. really? Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't have that sense, except there's a curious part where in, in her dream, when uh, Marty puts the makeup kit on to it, yeah. your weapon or the, the, like, yeah. the line, uh, that's in her dream. So in some sense, she does have an awareness of at least that projection on her. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think it's a great point, a really great point. I think that, like I was saying before, you know, uh, it's to my great, great um, uh, fortune that uh, they cast me. I don't, I think I was miscast as the femme fatale. I think that, but then, you know, I also know many, we call them almost Abbeys. I know a lot of the actresses that were also almost almost played that character. And, oh, jeez. The majority of us are not who you would necessarily see as classic femme fatales. And I think that that's probably why it works as well as it did, or it makes it a, for a more, I think that it, it has lasting power, that film, and the storytelling of it, because we were all kind of a little off. You know? I wasn't just, I wasn't just a, I wasn't the classic, you know, young bimbo wife, trophy wife. There was something else going on. 
Well, you're well, it's flat chested for one thing. I was to, I, I was so young. I hardly had any anything going on in my face at that point. I wasn't. I was afraid to move. You know, there was something you could project a lot of things on her. So, I think just that, as the men are projecting on her, she's an unwitting. Yeah. You know. Uh, uh, but but lo and behold, she is smartness enough to stay alive, whereas a lot most of you know a lot of them aren't. So um, I think. Um, uh, I had another point I was going to go. I don't know what it was. The, but the, the, fem, the claim, the feminist claim. The feminist the, uh, claim. Yeah. Uh, I, the, the, the empowerment of the, the fatal character. And maybe even think forward. Now, Marge is not a, a femme fatale, but she's certainly a powerful woman. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe in the man that wasn't there, that character there. Um, um, in terms of uh, yeah. um, it being somebody who's got agency and um, yeah, well, what's interesting in that is that she's like a little, pe a little too old to be a femme fatale. That's what's interesting. I mean, it's, she's more the bitch. She's the you know the the nagging wife more than a femme fatale. But see, they, they, that's what's great about a lot of the characters, a lot of the female characters. See, I don't necessarily think that Joel and Ethan's female characters are the best example of you know. Uh, great female roles, though I think that the way that they've they've um, they're getting better at it. Certainly, I think. Um, but I think uh, it's the way they cast them. They don't cast necessarily cast them stereotypically. They always cast their females a little off. So you're you, you don't have to. Um, but they're also not trying to make fem feminist statements. I don't think they were trying to make a feminist statement. I don't know. I don't know if I. I, I don't know if I want to take issue with the idea of femina, uh, femme fatale being a. It's kind of like I, I was just reading this article about these horrible, you know, discoveries of the prostitutes' bodies in, in uh, on Long Island, and you know how the the investigations of these bodies weren't. Th there wasn't an expediency to it because they were prostitutes, and oh, you know, they they were in the line of work that puts them at risk, so. You know, kind of this sense of well, they got what was going to happen in that dark world that they're venturing into, and there's something about the femme fatale is, is whatever she gets, she deserves that kind of thing, which I'm not sure feeds into my idea of a, a real feminist statement. Do you know what I mean? I don't know. I'm babbling now. <laughs> I think yeah. it wasn't really a question. You made a good point. Yeah, great. Come on, you go. Hi. Um, you have a very uh, unique background in that you, right out of school, you 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 know did this this uh, this movie uh, with the Coen Brothers it was their first movie too, and that over time you guys have you've kind of developed a very prolific uh, careers, but you always seem to come back with each other and you kind of evolved with each other as as you're, you're, you've gotten older and as your career has evolved. Um, I'd just be really interested to hear what you have to say about that relationship professionally. Mm -hmm. and socially. It's, um, it's been really fascinating because when we were at drama school, I really believed that I was going to be a member of a theater company somewhere. I, I, I believed, we, that's what we were, how we were trained to believe that as well. We were trained to be classical theater actors. So I believed that I was going to have a life in the theater where I moved through the classical female roles through, throughout my life. I, I didn't grow up going to the theater. I didn't grow up going to movies. I grew up with television. That's, I was from a working class background, and that's what we had was television. So to my, my, my uh, professional experience with Joel and Ethan has been like being in a theater company because I've worked on their films maybe every two to three years I've been cast in one of them in some fashion. So it has developed. We, we have grown up together and I think that their exposure, the exposure they've had to theater and other filmmakers through my work has informed the way they've used me subsequently. Like I know that, and, and, and it also, ha when you're a member of a company, it, it relieves a certain um, uh, anxiety, not just financially, but also, you know, uh, professionally, knowing that there possibly will be yet another role out there some, at some time. If I never did another movie again, except with them, be fine. Because it's the, you generally, I haven't loved everything I've done with them. Like I really hated Linda Litsky. I hated that job, and it wasn't really fun to do. I hated her. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't. I just didn't like anything about her. But I did it, and you know, I think I did it w the way they wanted it to be done. So, you know, that's also it has been a, a great part of it to know that it, just because somebody's writing your part doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a great part or one you even are satisfied doing or even want to do. But 
that's a part of that's been a part of our process. I don't get involved in the script writing at all. I I I I get involved. They've never asked me to be involved any more than that. I get involved when the script is done. They they they're ready to cast it, and we're going into production. That's when I get involved. And so, does that answer your question a little yeah, bit? Much. Julian. Mm. Yeah. Well, it's uh, it's sometimes it's sometimes startling. Sometimes, uh, like I, I wouldn't have necessarily like when I read Linda Litsky, it's like, fuck you, <laughs> because she's stupid. She's just stupid, and that's what the whole premise of her, you know, the whole action of that story is based on her her tenacity, her st uh, stupidity, and her tenacity. And then she teams up with another stupid person, and those two stupid people decide she's the smarter of the two. You know, it's just that's what ha that's what happened. And that and that, in fact, is a theme in a lot of their films. You can you I mean you could write a whole thesis about that. They've got always got two people, and one of the stupid people decides they're smarter than the other one. Um, Joel and Ethan. That would, that's where you start right there. Um, so sometimes it's a, it's a real surprise. Like why me? You know, then it's like uh, like with M Marge Gunderson. Uh, at that point in my career, I, my professional life, I would have been. I was much, much. I would have been much more interested in doing like a psycho killer, I, I, like a, a a pregnant cop. Uh, okay. And during the whole filming of it, we were much more interested in, uh, you know, Stephen uh, Peter's characters. We all loved their characters. You know, th those are the characters everybody was interested in knowing what was going to happen. And then it wasn't until the finished thing where I saw the real power of Marge, Marge's uh, place in the narrative. So it's, sometimes it's just a surprise to know. It's, it, because with their films, I don't choose to do their films. It's not like I get sent the script. I, I'm basically told I have the opportunity. And I take it. <laughs> so, do you uh, have one of their? Uh, do you have a film that they're come uh, down the pike that you're going to work on? Yes, I know that. Uh, uh, I know that I'm going to be the monster in a horror movie <laughs> <laughs> that takes place in an academic setting. Okay. And uh, there's another one. Uh, what was the other one? I forget what the other one was. But I know that, so, but, but that's also great that I know that as I age through my, you know, my professional life, I've got these things to look forward to. <laughs> right there. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, be, I really believe in reading. Uh, scripts, and I think this is from our theater training, dramaturgically, that you see where you fit into the whole. Like Joel always loves to tell the stories about, where, you know, you go on a film set, you go around to each person, and each actor tells the story of the film from their character's point of view. What's this movie about? Oh, it's about a woman who works at a, you know, a deli, and then this guy comes in, and it, you know, it's, uh, you know, the movie's about the guy, but the, from this person, this actor's point of view. So basically, it's like knowing where you fit dramaturgically into the whole, and then your and where you, the arc of your character in that dramaturgical narrative fits. And so, by telling my story properly, that I'm telling that small part or that whatever part of that story that fits into the lar lar larger narrative. Hence, why I like to do films that are scripts that are done or finished products, and also with a director who knows what that final product's going to be. So we're, we're running shy on yeah. time. And, and um, um, all of you uh, are going to have the wonderful opportunity to see Fargo, which is just an incredible performance. You don't have to sit through it again, though. No, I okay. can't. Um, uh, <laughs> I, I just, well, just take one last question. Yeah. Oh, no, I do, but... but... But I just wanted to tell you, it's not that we loved the murders here. We loved you. We loved your character. 
that Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think that probably is where what we can, what where I can speak to your theme of collaboration between actor and and filmmaker. That's what I do for them, and I think that um, you know uh, I give I give them heart, and in because they are they are great storytellers, and they have mastered so many things. And I think I I I believe, and and I don't mean this sentimentally or or egotistically, but I believe that what they've learned from me is that that is a necessary part of storytelling and not something to be afraid of, and that it can be. So, so would you, I really uh, want to thank you for your generosity, too. You're welcome. On this, I love uh, it. Thanks. Yeah. Um, and uh, would very much like to thank uh, Jim Miller for having uh, this brainchild of bringing all of the different branches of the New School together and Liz Carlson for your great help um, organizationally. And, and again, just one more hand for Fran. It's been a crazy week for Thank her. You. We really appreciate Thank you coming. You. Hope you like the movie.